Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm just going to kind of go over some of the detail from the design competition, which you're probably all familiar with, of kind of what our goals are. And then I'm going to hopefully give you a little bit of information to help you um, with your design to make sure that it actually can be successfully galvanized. Um, and then once I'm finished, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at the end or if Amanda needs to pass those on or whatever the case may be. So just to get started a little bit about uh, the association where I work, I know Amanda introduced me and I have probably met some of you um, along the way, but actually what our association is all about is we're nonprofit uh, trade association. So just as you as architect student, architecture students join AIAS, our members actually produce galvanized steel. Um, and they join our association to really have the technical support um, and the marketing unified voice for the industry. And we're not here just for our members, but also for all of you. So we really do give a lot of free assistance to specifiers throughout North America, um, students, and um, practicing architects and engineers as well. So what I hope to accomplish in this next uh, kind of hour together um, is to be able to recognize the positive benefits of utilizing hot galvanized steel, not only in this competition, but in future projects that you may be a part of. Also, I want to call out the appropriate specifications for your design so that you know what specifications you might want to mark down when you're working on this. Um, then we're going to go through how to design that ramp. Um, I'm not going to give you all the details, but just the major ones that you need to know so that it can actually be successfully galvanized. Um, some of those will be outside of the normal scope of an architect, but because you may not be working with an engineer, you'll probably be um, helpful for you to understand that and, and incorporate those into your design. And then finally, just some additional resources um, to get you started on where you can go to get some more assistance. So just as a refresher, um, as we're going through, these are the criteria that we're really trying to meet uh, with the design competition. I'm trying to get this out of my way here. Excuse me. Um, we want the ramps to be safe, and they have to meet the US and Canadian codes. Um, and that is up to you to figure that out and make sure that you're able to verify that. They need to be 100% hot dip galvanized steel. They need to be modular and interchangeable design features so that they can be attached to homes of different elevation and things of that nature, ways that we can add or take away to make that work. Uh, attractive and lightweight, easy to erect, and made from uh, low-cost, readily available materials. So let's start out with um, just a refresher real quick on hot dip galvanizing. If you guys have seen me around, you've probably heard this spiel a few times, but I just want to make sure um, that you're all familiar with the process that we're talking about and uh, a little bit about how the steel is produced. And then from there, we can talk more about the benefits and the design features you want to be aware of. So this is just a look at the hot dip galvanizing process. You can see there's a number of steps involved. Um, there's really only three major steps involved, um, surface preparation, the actual galvanizing um, process itself, and then an, an inspection. So let's go through each of these various um, steps in a little bit more detail for you. It starts with surface preparation. This is really the most critical part of the process, because if the steel is not cleaned properly, then the reaction with the molten zinc will not occur. And therefore, you will not develop the coating that we're looking for. So this is something that is handled by the galvanizer on its facility. It's not something that you necessarily need to worry about calling out how to do it, but it's just for your reference. So basically, the galvanizer is going to put the steel through a series of three chemical cleaning steps. And at the end of that, that seal is going to be at to like a near white metal clean, the same thing that could be accomplished with like abrasive blasting um, or other mechanical forms of cleaning the steel. 
Um, so the first step is just a degreasing. It's going to get all the dirt, the oil, the organic residue off of the piece. And it's going to be rinsed and go into a pickling tank, which is actually a mild acidic solution um, that's going to take off the milk scale and oxides. Um, and it's going to come out of that bath really at a near white metal clean. And then we're going to go into the fluxing stage, which is just a final mild cleaning and providing a protective layer um, to make sure that no oxide will form on that part before it goes into the zinc bath. The next step would be the actual galvanizing phase of the process, as we would call it. And the seal is actually immersed in the bath of molten zinc that's at about 830 degrees Fahrenheit. It does have to be 98% pure zinc. Uh, the other 2% is to the galvanizer's discretion. Um, they use things such as aluminum, bismuth, and nickel to help with uh, the fluidity of the zinc and the shine of the coating and various other things. Uh, while that seal is actually immersed in the molten zinc bath, the iron in the steel will react with the zinc in the kettle to form the coating. So it's actually um, not just on the surface like a paint coating would be, but actually becomes a part of the steel. The reaction um, is going to be complete when the steel reaches bath temperature, uh, typically around five to seven minutes depending on the thickness of the steel, but more or less the, the kettle operator knows um, when they've reached that temperature because the bubbling on the surface will begin to dissipate. Finally, before that piece of steel leaves the galvanizer's facility, he's going to uh, perform an inspection on it. Um, and it is basically just to verify conformance to the specifications that we're going to review in just a little bit. Um, the first inspection is really visual. It's very easy to identify any de defects because, as I mentioned, if the steel wasn't properly cleaned, you'll see where the issues lie. Um, and then finally, a magnetic thickness gauge would be used to check for the coating thickness and to um, ensure that it actually meets the specification. So before I go into the benefits, I do like to talk just briefly about what is zinc, because we all kind of know a little bit about zinc. We know, hopefully, that it is a required um, part of our diet for our health. But it's also the main component of the galvanized process, as I mentioned. So I'd like to just go back there is a lot of misinformation out there about zinc being uh, potentially harmful. And so I'd like to just make sure that everyone understands that this is a natural, a naturally occurring element um, that we're exposed to daily, and it's not harmful to us. So following down that track, zinc is actually very natural. Um, about 5.8 million tons of zinc are naturally cycled through the environment annually. Um, and that's through things, just um, air, rainwater, natural phenomena. And it just moves the zinc around in our environment. Um, and all, in, all organisms, from the tiniest microorganisms all the way up to us, do require zinc to live. Um, it is essential to all life. Um, it is possible to get too much zinc in your system, but very difficult. Because through evolution, we've all developed homeostasis to help regulate those differences in the zinc content. Uh, what's of much larger concern is actually zinc deficiency. About 800,000 people die in developing countries every year just because they don't have enough zinc in their diet. Um, fortunately for those of us in North America, because that zinc is prevalent in our society and in our uh, drinking water, we don't have that issue. Uh, but it is of concern. You don't want to eliminate zinc from our environment or from our diet. It's also um, commonly found in products that we use every day that you may or may not be aware of. Uh, one of the most common uses of zinc is actually in sunscreen. Zinc oxide as a single ingredient can block more UV ray than any other single ingredient can. Um, so it's in all sunblocks. It's also in the treatment of sunburn. Some of the other uh, items that you see here, cosmetics, tires, cold remedies, a little bit of everything. But the zinc that we're here to talk about today for the design program is in the hot dip galvanized coating. So why use hot dip galvanizing, or why are we encouraging you to learn more about hot dip galvanizing? Well, the number one reason is just because you're probably not learning about it in school. And even practicing architects and engineers, um, the number one market limitation that we face is ignorance about the product. Um, complete ignorance, not even knowing that it exists, or uh, misinformation about its actual benefits or performance. So just quickly, I want to hit the um, 
four or five benefits that you see here, corrosion protection, durability, longevity, et cetera. And then we're going to talk on the design side. So the first reason why galvanized steel is really um, utilized, or the, the main benefit that people will highlight, is its corrosion protection. And it is a kind of a three-pronged uh, monster. It starts with barrier protection, which is the simple just putting a barrier between steel and the environment so that um, corrosion does not start. Um, but then galvanized second level protection is actually known as cathodic protection. Um, and this has to do with basically the electrochemical potential of metals. Um, zinc is very high on the galvanic series of metals and therefore wants to kind of sacrifice itself to protect everybody else. Um, so when you put zinc and steel in contact, the zinc will actually sacrifice its electrons to prevent the steel from rusting. So it kind of acts as like a, a little savior on the steel. Um, the really the third and most important part of galvanizing corrosion protection um, is the zinc patina. And this is basically um, zinc, as all metals, does corrode when exposed to the environment. Um, however, um, those byproducts actually build on the surface of the galvanized coating and provide an additional layer of protection. Uh, when that zinc patina is fully developed, it actually, um, galvanized steel will corrode at about 1 30th the rate of bare steel in the same environment. So it slows that corrosion rate down very to a, almost a halt. Another of the kind of benefits to be aware of is the durability. Um, and this comes into play very much with the ramp competition that we're talking about because obviously um, there's a potential for that ramp to kind of get beat up a little bit, either in, during erection or um, during use. So galvanized is very abrasion resistant. Um, and that has to do with the coating and the development of the coating that we were just discussing that happens in galvanizing kettle. Um, while that iron and the steel and the zinc react, it forms a series of intermetallic layers um, in the coating, which you can see here. Um, and those layers are actually um, part zinc, part iron, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and they're actually harder than the base steel. Those DPN numbers are a measure of hardness. So, the gamma, delta, and zeta layer actually harder than the base steel itself, um, allowing it or making it very difficult to damage the coating. Um, while the eta layer is a little bit more ductile and can absorb impact, so it's very difficult to damage the coating, which is also um, because of the bond strength. It's bonded to the steel at about 3,600 psi. So it's, as I mentioned before, become a part of the steel. In addition to that kind of strong bond and that abrasion resistance, the galvanized steel coating also grows um, perpendicular to every surface, as you can kind of see here. So that means that the corners and edges of a steel part will have the same amount of protection as flat areas. So there's no areas for weakness um, or for anything less to, you know, less protection in any particular area. Oh, sorry, you can still see my pen drawing. Um, longevity is also very important to the specification of galvanized steel or why it's used commonly. And um, we really talk about that mostly in the time to first maintenance and atmospheric conditions, which for the ramps that we're going to be building, this is what we're looking at because these ramps are going to be put in um, exposed areas out in, you know, the natural flowing air. They're not going to be submerged in water, buried in the soil. Um, so what this chart is basically showing you is the length of life for a galvanized steel product. Um, depends on the design of your ramp um, and the thickness of the steel that you select. Um, this most likely will be maybe like a tubular material or something that's a little bit thinner. Um, for thicker like quarter inch steel, thick steel, quarter inch thick steel or greater, um, 3.9 mils is the minimum requirement. Um, but for the sake of this, because we're probably going to be using a little bit lighter weight material, let's just use this 3 mil um, average here. And it may be slightly less or more, but um, we'll look at that one. Most likely, um, you're not going to go into an industrial environment, but you might if this is going into a very urban um, area, like a downtown city. Um, and we can just check that since it's the most um, corrosive to galvanized steel. So if you have three mils of zinc on your piece of steel and you come up the line here to the industrial um, environment 
and take that over, if I can draw a semi-straight line, you'll see that we're talking about 55 years of life before first maintenance. So by creating these ramps with galvanized steel and attaching them to their home, we're basically giving them access to the home, their home for their life, um, most likely, unless they're very young. Um, maybe they may need a replacement at some point. But this is just time to first maintenance. So at that point, 5% um, rusting is visible, but 95% of the galvanized steel is still, or the galvanized coating is still an, intact. So um, the life, actual design life of this ramp could be much longer than that 55 years. A few other benefits, just to highlight real quickly, is the availability and the versatility. Um, both steel and zinc are very abundant. Um, zinc is the 27th most abundant element in the Earth's crust, and iron is fourth. So they're readily available. However, the majority of, um, or a lot of these products are actually coming from recycled sources now. Um, both steel and zinc are 100% recyclable indefinitely without the loss of properties. What that means is that steel can be recycled to be steel over and over again, and zinc can be recycled to be zinc over and over again. So um, unlike when you recycle paper or something that typically doesn't become another form of paper but may be downcycled into some other um, product. So actually recyclability at the end of life is important, but also the new sources of steel and zinc are coming often from recycled sources as well. About 70% um, of all steel, and when you talk about structural shapes, about 95% of all steel is coming from recycled sources. Um, on the zinc side, about 30% of all zinc is coming from recycled sources these days. Um, also, galvanized steel is factory, factory controlled, and it's produced throughout North America. Um, and it's very efficient and safe. You can stock parts, which is kind of what we're talking about with this idea is that you could have modular elements that would be interchangeable. So a galvanizer could actually produce the parts of your ramp and keep them stocked for when there is a need for a ramp to go up. And they could maybe contact your Freedom by Design chapter and you could go out and, and put up this ramp. So there's a lot of advantage there. It also, um, steel and galvanized steel have seismic advantages. It's a little bit more um, flexible than like a concrete structure, so it's able to move better if there is a seismic event and often the structural integrity is, is saved. Another thing that often is of importance, um, especially when we're talking to architects, is the aesthetics. Um, galvanized steel is a silvery gray color. It's got a modern, natural um, appearance. Um, for this design competition, most likely that is what you will be designing and producing is just bare galvanized steel. Um, because we don't want to create maintenance um, or painting over or more trouble for that particular um, veteran that we hope to serve. We want to just give them a no maintenance ramp on the front of their house. So um, the natural finish does blend with most surroundings. It's a uniform kind of matte gray. Um, sometimes it starts out a little bit bright and shinier, but over time it will kind of weather to a matte gray color. Um, using galvanized still also gives you a lot more design freedom because the fact that you need less material to do the same amount of work as you do with concrete. So you have lighter weight um, material. The strength to weight ratio is higher, so you can kind of have less pieces and get the same um, type of structure. Finally, um, for future knowledge or use, probably not on this particular project, if you don't like the appearance of hot dip galvanized steel, if you don't like that metallic gray color, you actually can paint or powder coat over galvanized steel so that you can keep all of the other benefits we've been discussing today, but also add um, the color preference that you prefer. Finally, which um, is a good thing that we're all very interested in these days and because of the um, kind of structure that we're building, sustainability is always um, very important and comes into play. Um, a couple of notes on the sustainability. We talked about a few of these, but zinc is natural and it's abundant. It's essential to life, as I mentioned. It is 100% recyclable, both the zinc and the steel. Um, because of the longevity that we discussed, we're reducing the need for maintenance. And that basically wipes out not only the environmental costs, emissions, waste of natural resources, additional energy, 
It also leads to economic savings because you're not paying to go out and maintain structure. You've paid for it once and then you can let it sit until it's um, kind of run its course. Okay, so if we have any questions about that or we want to save them to the end, what I'd like to do is move on um, into some of the design specifics that you want to incorporate when you're working on your uh, ramp design. Um, now, I'm, I know for a lot of you, designing a ramp might not be the most exciting thing. It's not a building or whatever, but it is very important that not only is it structurally sound and workable, but also that it's going to be able to survive the galvanizing process successfully. So let's talk about uh, the specifications you want to familiarize yourself with, and then some of the, the design elements you want to consider when you create your ramp. So there are three main galvanizing specifications to be aware of. For this ramp design, more than likely, all you're going to need is ASTM A123. However, you may have hardware, bolts um, and nuts that are going to connect your design, and therefore you would want also to call out ASTM A153. Um, more than likely, you're not going to have any rebar in this design. But So the main specifications um, would be A123 and A153. Um, and then there's a bunch of supporting specifications, which is a lot of what the rest of the design best practices I'm going to go over today come from. And um, they are A143, A384, and A385. So if you have access to get to the ASTM specs, I would highly encourage you to read them. Um, but if not, um, because they do cost to purchase, um, you can use a lot of our resources and get the same information that you need. Um, in addition to those design supporting specifications, there's a touch-up and repair specification, A780, which will be important to know once we get to the point of maybe erecting the ramp. Um, and then the duplex systems that we talked about, just for your reference, I listed on there, 6386 and 7803. So when we get into designing a hot tip galvanized structure of any kind, but in particular this ramp, the number one thing to keep in mind is that communication is key. Um, and communication uh, between the design engineer or architect, which is yourself, um, with maybe a fabricator or a steel detailer and with a galvanizer and all of those channels is quite important. Um, and to discuss the various items that you see on the screen here, which we're going to go into um, going forward. So steel chemistry and surface condition. Let's start with that. So when you go to select, the materials that you're going to put into your ramp, you want to be aware of a few things. Basically, any ferrous containing metal or metal that contains iron um, can be galvanized. Um, most commonly, that's a mild carbon steel, but sometimes weathering steel or stainless steel is used. For this particular project, more than likely, you're going to want to use a carbon steel because it's less expensive and more readily available. Um, fasteners, again, they are centrifuge after to remove excess zinc, but they can be galvanized and should be used when you're connecting galvanized steel structures. Um, castings, we don't need to really talk about. There shouldn't be a use for that in this particular design. So when you go to select the type of steel that you are going to use in your ramp um, from like a steel mill or steel center, um, the, one of the most important things to be aware of is the steel chemistry, and in particular, the silicon content of that steel. Um, silicon acts as a catalyst for coating growth. And uh, although the life of a zinc coating is linear to the amount of zinc present, you can get too much of a good thing. So it's important to try to work with steel, um, and especially because we're looking for a lightweight design and something that um, you know the galvanizer can produce um, as a kind of charitable thing. He doesn't want to put tons and tons of zinc on this. He wants to put near the minimum. So basically what this um, chart is showing you is that there are two ranges that you want to get your silicon content in for galvanized steel. Down in this range, which is below 0.04%, or in this white range here, which is basically 0.15 to 0.23%. Steel can be galvanized outside of these ranges and is all the time, but it's known as a highly reactive steel and oftentimes uh, will grow an excess zinc coating, which is not something we want um, for this particular design, nor for the fit of the element. 
Also, it's important to uh, make sure that the surface condition of the two steels you're working with is similar. So if you get an old, really pitted piece of steel and then a very like nice, smooth machine part, and galvanizing them and put them together, you're going to see a difference in their look, as you can see on the slides here. Um, so it's very important to try to keep your chemistry similar, your age of your steel similar, um, you know, the fabrication methods kind of similar, and, may, and then the process requirements or time that the galvanizer puts should be fairly similar to keep that more uniform. The next element to really discuss is the size and shape. For the ramp competition, this really shouldn't come into play because one of the criteria we talked about was lightweight, um, and ramps are not overly large. But just for your reference, some things to know. Um, a variety of shapes and sizes can be galvanized and are successfully galvanized all the time. The average kettle is 40 feet in length, so the length is not an issue. Um, they're usually not very wide and not very deep, but these the elements that are going to be galvanized to the ramp most likely are going to be narrow um, and can be dipped and then assembled after galvanizing. Um, you can design large structures and modulars or subunits. You can con um, connect after galvanizing. And if they were too large for the kettle, they can actually be progressively dipped where one side is dipped and then the other, which again, we should not run into on this particular project. Another thing to keep in mind when you're designing this ramp is how the steel is processed in the plant. And I showed you processes at the very beginning, and it showed you there's overhead cranes and hoists that move the steel from one end to the other. So the galvanizer is going to need a way to pick up the pieces that you provide to him for this ramp. So keep that in mind. Um, he may have a racking system that he already uses that he can use, but otherwise he might need some temporary lifting points or holes that he can um, you know, wire into to get the piece through the process successfully. Let's talk a little bit about the temperature and the concerns that come into play with that. Um, as you remember, hopefully, from a little bit earlier, I told you that the galvanized steel kettle is heated to 830 degrees Fahrenheit. So when you take a piece of steel that's at room temperature, around 74 or 80 degrees, and you dip it and heat it up to um, those high temperatures, you basically are relieving stresses in the steel. And um, when you work with um, a steel that uses a lot of severe cold working, as it's called, it can introduce embrittlement in those areas. Um, that embrittlement is there whether the, gal whether the piece is galvanized or not but hot dip galvanizing accelerates that effect. So it's very important um, when you're looking at the design to keep these things in mind. So that's for embrittlement specifically. The other thing, um, when you are heating up a piece of steel um, and cooling it, is that different sizes of material or thicknesses are going to heat and cool at different rates. So when you attach a very thick piece of galvanized steel to a very thin walled piece, um, the thinner piece will heat up faster. And what does steel do when it's hot or anything when it's hot? It wants to move. Um, and if it is attached to a piece that's still relatively cold and not flexible, it can actually um, cause issues with um, distortion or warping. Um, so there's some tips on the screen here for maybe helping with those concerns using symmetrical designs. Um, equal or near equal thicknesses in your assemblies if you're going to connect something before galvanize. Um, the bend radii, uh, the weld joints, using temporary bracing, all of these things can come into play with your design to make sure it can be galvanized and comes out as you expected it. Um, bending and drainage is something that you most certainly will come into um, effect for your design because most likely um, to be modular, you may use some sort of tubular structural tubing or um, tubular piece um, or a handrail, which is typically um, hollow on the inside. So venting and drainage is very important. Um, I have a few slides here to show that. Some may or may not be relevant to your design. But the moral of the story is, again, when you take a piece of, galvanized, or a piece of steel that is uh, at room temperature and heat it up um, and you run zinc through it, if you do not have a way for air to escape a hollow structure, um, you can actually 
build up enough pressure inside of that to explode. And that's obviously very dangerous to our galvanizing personnel and not very good for your design as it often is basically ruptured at that point. Um, the other venting and draining that you will see is actually to help with the flow of the zinc. For instance, is what you see on the slide here. Cropping the corners um, allows zinc to, to flow out of certain areas um, and not get trapped there and get a bunch of excess zinc in the corner. Here's where I was talking about with hollow structures, where there needs to be venting um, in between where the handrail is connected as well as on the exterior for that air to go out um, and for the drink to fully flow into and out of these structures. It's important because that provides corrosion protection on both the inside and the outside of the hollow structure, so no corrosion begins where we can't see it inside. Um, if you have a base plate on the end of um, any sort of um, tubular structure or whatever, you need to keep an area for the zinc, again, to go in and air to escape and come back out. Um, fully open is um, preferred, but any of these others are acceptable um, alternatives. Welding, again, if you're going to use any welding in your design versus just um, some connections with bolts and things, um, you want to be um, careful of a couple of things. One, uh, if you're welding before galvanizing, you want to pick a weld rod that has similar chemistry to your seal. Um, if you pick one with a high silicon content, again, that's a catalyst for coating growth, and you're going to get something similar to the picture on the bottom of the screen here, where you have this nice, bright, and shiny part, and then you have like a bump and this really dull part. Um, and that has to do with the weld rod chemistry that was used there. Um, also, they need, the welds need to be cleaned very well before galvanized, galvanizing. And you also need to be aware of if you're overlapping surfaces, that again, if you get any steam inside there and build up pressure, it can cause issues. So um, there's a difference between whether you should seal weld or stitch weld and whether or not you need vent holes in your weld. So again, those are in the specifications and in some of the other resources that I will provide to you at the end of the presentation. Um, threaded parts, um, most likely you're probably going to have some sort of fastener in your um, particular design, and they can also be galvanized. Um, and they're galvanized in the same process, but they are spun to get the excess zinc off the thread. Um, but what you do have to think about when you're using fasteners is that um, you have to account for the zinc coating that's going to be picked up on the thread. So they're going to be a little bit larger than they were um, when they were bare steel, and therefore the fit can be important. Um, the standard practice is to oversize or um, overtap the holes or the nuts. So basically you would galvanize a nut as a blank and then re-thread it after, or you need to make this, the hole a little bit larger or ream it out after galvanizing. So again, planning that in your design can be very important. Finally, just two uh, more little additional design considerations. Um, to make sure that you want to include with your design to keep, make it kind of a very complete, ready to go to the galvanizer sort of um, design is um, masking and marking. So if there was an area on a particular piece of steel that you did not want coating to grow um, because you needed to weld it or something after studs were being driven in, um, you actually can use some masking material, as you see in the picture here, that where the coating did not actually grow in that particular area. It kept that that part kind of a dirty steel that wouldn't um, pick up the coating. And then finally, marking. Um, to mark the pieces to, so the galvanizer knows that those all go together on this one particular project can be very important. However, there are certain marking uh, materials that should not be used because they can't be cleaned off in the process and they will result in a bare spot on the piece of steel. So it's very important, again, to make sure that you are marking this with um, either some sort of temporary or, permanent, um, temporary or permanent method that will not cause any damage to the coating or the coating growth. So in summary, I'll wrap up here and then we'll open it up for your questions. Um, there's a number of additional resources for you to look at to really develop how to put your design together. Our website galvanize.org has a lot of information um, readily available to you. Also, the AGA design guide, um, you can either download a PDF version on our website or request a printed copy. And basically, all of the slides that I showed you today with those design elements 
are in the design guide with more detail on what you need to know to put into your drawing and the exact specifications that you should use. Um, also, SDS2, or Design Data, has a detailed software that allows you to select galvanizing as an option, and it will do a lot of those details for you on connections and, um, and threaded parts and stuff. So if you are able to, or, you can, or if you're working with an engineering um, student or something that maybe can have access to that, um, maybe you can use that particular software. Again, refer to the ASTM specifications 384 and 385 are most important, and they are covered in our design guide. So once again, if you get the design guide, you're kind of covering your bases there. Get in touch with your local galvanizer. Um, just as I said at the beginning, communication is key. And talking with your galvanizer as you're working through this process um, can be really beneficial. He'll be happy to help you um, as much as he can. He's not going to give you all the answers. But you know that way, you can start to build that relationship. So once the design, um, winning design is selected, maybe you can go back, or he can come back to you, and you guys can build a ramp in your community. He also. Um, the galvanizer will be more than happy to provide you with a tour of his facility so you can see the process um, in action that I've been talking about. And I think that we're going to work with AIAS to maybe try to organize some of these tours um, this summer for you because I think that that really brings it home to you why some of these things are important in the way you design your piece of steel. You'll also get to know your local galvanizer and you'll get to see a little bit more about how the types of things they run through the plant and how they process them. Um, another great resource is the American Institute of Steel Construction, or AISC. Uh, one of the requirements is for readily available materials. So how do you figure that out? Well, the AISC has a steel solution center that can probably tell you a lot of information about that. Um, maybe even check the stability of your design for you once you have it together. They may be able to look at that and say, this is structurally sound, or you need to make some alterations. They may be able to help you with that. Um, also, they have listings of steel supply centers and steel mills that can tell you what materials they readily stock and the cost of those so that you have justification and proof that the design that you've created does meet those criteria we set forward for you. And finally, just um, again, I'll open it up for any questions that you may have. You can start following um, AGA um, either through our website or we have basically all of the social media outlets. So if you'd like to um, learn more about us and what we're doing on a regular basis, please feel free to um, follow us on any of those that you see on the screen. And with that, I will open it up and be happy to take any questions we may have, Amanda. All right, we have a few questions, um, but before I get to them, I just want to let everybody know that the presentation was recorded, um, and it will be posted on the competition website this week, uh, www.aias.org backslash ascension. Um, and Melissa will be at grassroots uh, this July, um, so if you guys get started on your design and have some additional questions, um, you guys can chat one-on-one -on -one with her there. Uh, okay, so the first question, um, does readily available mean local hardware store or local fabric fabricator? I think this was um, in regards to the competition evaluation uh, criteria. Okay, so readily available, typically, some steel fabricators will stock material on their actual, at their actual facility. Many of them do not. They will call and order um, job by job from either a steel service center or a steel mill directly. Um, a steel service center is actually kind of a go-between where you can just go and get a few small parts. You don't have to get a huge shipment like you do from a steel mill. And um, there are service centers located throughout the U.S. So um, these these are going to be produced um, not necessarily just in your local backyard, but all over the country um, once the wing design is selected. So what I would suggest is um, doing some research to find a steel service center in your area and have a, some discussion with them. Explain to them that you're working on this design competition and this is a requirement and you want to get some more information. Or contact AISC to see if they can get you in contact with someone or someone at the Solutions Center can maybe give you a little bit more detail on the steel that's readily available. 
All right. And question number two, is it possible to weld HDG after it's dipped? Yes, you can weld after um, galvanizing, but it does present some additional kind of concerns that you don't necessarily have before, uh, if you weld before galvanizing. Basically, the big thing is that um, when you weld on galvanized steel, you can actually put out some um, fumes, some zinc metal fumes. And if you inhale those, they can make you feel a little sick, like you have the flu. Um, and that's typically why it's recommended that if you're going to weld on galvanized steel, that you grind the coating away or you could use masking, as we talked about, um, and actually do the weld and then touch it up with a form of um, acceptable touch-up. However, um, there are skilled welders that will weld right on the coating and um, then push the zinc back. Um, the concern and kind of the scare tactic is about the zinc metal fume fever and being able to um, get sick um, from those fumes. But if you're protecting yourself like you would welding any other material, that won't be the concern. The real concern for why you wouldn't want to weld directly on the galvanized steel is because if you get liquid zinc in that weld, it can weaken the structural integrity of the weld. Um, so therefore, that's why we would recommend that you would grind it away. Um, it, depending on the design and the fabrication, it may make more sense to weld something together before it goes through the galvanizing bath because then you get full coverage over that weld, um, and that way you have you know, equal coverage throughout the whole piece. But it really just depends on your particular design, what makes more sense. All right, the next question, um, is the AGA design guide a free resource? Yes, it is free. So you can go on our website in our publications area, and you can download a PDF for free. So if you prefer to be able to just look at it on your screen and have the PDF, you can do it that way. Um, if you prefer an actual printed copy that you can thumb through so that it's like right there when you're working on your design or whatever, um, that also we will provide um, any person that requests basically um, any architect or engineer or student, um, for instance, that requests one complimentary copy of that. Um, so you can basically either email me or you can order that online and we'll just send you one in the mail. Um, but either way, it's complimentary to you. You can either download the PDF or you can request a printed copy of the design guide and we will give that to you for free. All right, uh, the next question is, what is the process for field welding galvanized steel? Okay, I touched on that just a bit, but again, the big thing would be um, you want to grind coating away about two to four inches. Um, where the weld is going to be placed, then you would weld it, and then you would go ahead and touch up that welded area with um, one of the acceptable forms of touch-up, which would be a zinc-rich paint, a zinc-based solder, or zinc metallizing. Most commonly, it's just done with a zinc-rich um, paint spray um, that's sprayed on. But um, if you knew that you were going to weld in a certain area, you could possibly try masking that area off so that the coating doesn't grow in that two to four inches and then weld over it, but that would be the typical, um, that would be the best practice for field welding. I see people that don't do that all the time, but that would be what I would recommend you do. All right, uh, so you mentioned low maintenance for, gal for galvanizing after certain periods of time. However, what is involved in actually maintaining it? Can it be a do-it-yourself job? Yes, I think for the ramp and the size of the ramp, it very well could be. Um, so you're typically with these ramps, you're going to be well beyond um, the life of the ramp before it's going to need that. But if you do need to do some maintenance to the galvanized steel once it's in place, it's pretty simple. You're going to go out and inspect, and you're going to find the areas that are showing some red rust. And you're going to clean them up. Um, you're going to get all that rust off either with you know, some sandpaper grinding or blasting of some kind. And then you're going to spray on um, a zinc-rich paint probably in those areas. That would be kind of the bare minimum maintenance that you would do. If you want to, um, another thing that you can do is you could do that same process I just mentioned, touch up those areas that are show, starting to show some signs of corrosion. And then you could paint over the entire piece 
and put like a different color to it. And that's just going to extend the life of the coating even longer because that paint and the galvanizing will work in kind of synergy. So the paint will last longer and then the galvanizing will last longer because the paint is protecting it um, while it's on. So there's a number of things you can do to extend the life of the galvanizing once it's in place. Also because these ramps are kind of, um, the goal is to make them kind of modular and interchangeable in design. If they don't use a lot of welding and they use a lot of bolted connections, um, they, it may be possible, we actually have a project example that was a whole parking structure like this, where they could actually take it apart and reassemble it somewhere else. So if that's possible, you could actually disassemble it, regalvanize the pieces, and reassemble it in place. It obviously would have to be completely taken down for part of that time, but again, if the, the parts are easily connected and disconnected, you could do that very simply and just replace the bolt. All right, so the next question is, how well does galvanized steel hold up against de-icing salts for areas that get snow in the winter? That's a great question, um, because I'm sure that some of you are in areas where there may need to be some de-icing put down on that ramp. Um, so. Actually, galvanized steel is commonly used in guardrail, um, in bridge structures, also in reinforcing steel that's embedded in the concrete that does get de-iced or on it. Um, the de-icing salts are very corrosive um, to all metal and zinc included. But the, the advantage is that typically when you put that salt down, um, they're going to be there for a little while and then they're going to be washed off, either by more snow or rain or something. Um, so typically, the, the galvanized steel can weather through that as long as they're not constantly covered in that salt or the salt kind of spray. Um, so as long as they're able to kind of get washed off um, and there's not like salt sitting up next to the um, base of the galvanized steel or, you know, the edge of it um, constantly, there shouldn't be a big concern. Um, but yes, I think certainly in areas that we are going to put them in, um, like that, that we're probably going to want some instruction maybe for the um, owner of that ramp on what is the best practice, uh, whether it means that once it warms up they should go and hose it down or whatever, but our technical team can provide any of that detail. But um, typically you will see some decreased life, but most likely it won't be that um, significant because again, it will not stay present on the surface all, at all times. All right, so you mentioned both steel and zinc are readily recyclable. Once they're galvanized, are they still recyclable? That's a great question. Yes, they are. Actually, you can take a piece of galvanized steel um, from a, a demolished job site or wherever it may be, and that steel will be sent to the steel mill for recycling. Um, as they start to heat that steel up, actually the zinc and the steel melt at different temperatures. So the zinc is going to melt first, and as they continue to heat that up um, to get that steel to a molten level, the zinc is actually collected in the bag house of the electric art furnace, um, and that zinc dust, basically, that's collected in the bag house is sold off to the zinc recycler, and they can take that zinc and refine it and reprocess it and create new zinc, um, and then the steel would stay there at the steel mill and be recast into a new shape. So actually, they are able to reuse both parts of that um, even after they're combined. All right, the next question. Uh, you mentioned the kettles are plenty long but are not that wide or deep. So is it possible to be able to galvanize a sheet? And if so, what sizes? Um, you can galvanize a sheet. However, the biggest concern with that is oftentimes how thick or thin it is. If you want to galvanize a real thin sheet of metal, um, basically they're going to stick that in um, kind of vertically. So it's not going to be laid flat. It's going to be um, taken in like a piece of paper would go down into a shredder. It's going to be thin way. Um, and then that could cause distortion. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And depending on your design, it may be that that 
if you're using a sheet metal, like for instance on the um, the surface that the, the wheelchair or whatever would ride on, um, you may want to select a readily available galvanized sheet steel, um, not something that the galvanizer would galvanize after. Now, I wouldn't recommend that your whole design be that because my members don't actually create that product, but if you want to, you might just call out that maybe like a G90 coating would be used there. Um, as for the, the width and the depth of the coating, for what you're designing, it really um, should not be an issue because most galvanizing kettles are uh, usually six feet or more wide and anywhere from six to 12 feet deep. So usually the dimension of your design and the way that they can hang that to dip is very simple. Um, and they can maneuver it in a way that will fit. That's, the length is always the hardest dimension to work with with most galvanized steel because you're galvanizing a long um, beam or post or light, um, a nice light structure or overhead sign structure. So typically the width and the depth are not of concern for the dimensions. Um, but again, that'd be a great opportunity if you're thinking about a design and you just can't figure out how it would fit in a dimension that seems small, to go visit a galvanizer in your area and talk about it with them. Show them your sketch and say, you know, how would you dip this and is it going to work? Because what he'll probably tell you is, yes, it will work this way, but this part of your design would be very hard for me to handle and maybe he can give you some ideas on a little bit different way that he's seen someone do something similar that will more successfully uh, or go through the process more successfully. But yeah, usually the, you don't need to worry too much about the, the uh, width or the depth, but also a great opportunity to just get in touch with your galvanizer or call us here at the AGA and talk us through what you're thinking and we'll figure it out. All right, we have a couple more questions. Um, the next one, is there any minimum height for the ramp? Does it have to reach a whole floor level or can it be just a few inches high? Um, I think the goal is that it can be interchangeable. So if you can figure out a way, uh, whether that's like the, a post that has notches in it, that it can be raised um, to fit a certain elevation. Um, or something, that would be ideal. Um, because what we would like to do is be able to take the ramp design that you create and not really have to modify the whole thing, but just be able to you know, either create taller or shorter posts or pieces to fit the different elevations. So, because as you know, everyone's um, house fits a little bit differently. Some people um, they're, you know, um, they don't really need a ramp or their front door might be directly even with the ground outside and they maybe just need a little ramp to get over the door frame. Other people have two or three steps to get up into their front door. Um, so, you know, we're not talking about a ramp that's going to go up to the third or fourth floor of a building, but just to get into a home and they are going to have different elevations. So be innovative in the way that you design that to think about how it could translate, whether it's just for a few inches or for a few feet. All right, we have another climate question. How does galvanized steel perform in a dry, hot desert climate like Las Vegas? Great question. Actually, um, dry, arid climates are really um, very simple for galvanized steel. Um, it actually can perform um, in temperatures from like 40 degrees below all the way up to about 180 degrees Fahrenheit um, with no like issues as far as, you know, like delamination or um, any kind of uh, damage to the coating and the coating life. So um, one of the advantages that you will likely see um, in an uh, arid climate like Las Vegas or here where I live in Colorado is that the life of the coating is typically longer um, because it's not exposed to rain and other elements that, um, you know, kind of get the patina more active and moving again. So oftentimes in very arid climates, the, the coating life is longer. Um, but it actually performs and is prepared to perform in that, that setting as well as in a setting like New York or um, up in uh, Montreal, Canada, there's a lot of galvanized steel that I have 
that's actually up in the Northern Territories in Canada because of the fact that it's coal and they have a short construction cycle and not a lot of room for maintenance. So um, those temperature concerns are really um, well within the confines of what galvanized steel is, is used to performing in. All right, is the ramp meant to be made with standardized pieces only? Um, it's up to you. The big thing is just that they are something that is readily available or easy to find from like a steel mill. Don't you know? get so creative that it's like impossible to get that particular piece of steel that you're using uh, because then that makes it expensive. And the, uh, one of the other criteria is um, inexpensive to create. So, um, you know, it doesn't mean it has to be a standard, you know, set product. It just needs to be one that is readily available. So your design might use something that we hadn't thought of that would work in the design that's readily available. It might be some kind of, you know, um, signpost or something that you find really easily, but that could work in your design in a certain way. So it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a set standard product. It just needs to be readily available. So as long as you can verify that that is an easy product to find and relatively inexpensive and you can use it in your design, more power to you. But um, don't get into really custom made that needs to be you know, cut and fabricated each and every ramp because if we're going to try to create several of these throughout the country um, each year and my members are donating their work, um, they don't want to take on the expense of a, you know, custom, uh, fancy, expensive design every time. So it's something that is easy for them to find and, and recreate over and over again is the goal. All right, are moving parts discouraged? That's a great question. I didn't uh, really address that today. There are some concerns when you're working with moving parts um, because of the, the zinc coating thickness um, and the fit working together. Um, usually what's best is have them galvanized um, separately and then assembled after. Um, but there are some regulations or some um, standards for like the maybe extra um, space that you want between your two moving parts to make sure they fit together. Um, those would also be outlined in our design guide um, and a good opportunity to probably talk through that a little bit with the galvanizer to make sure it's going to work. But we do have telescoping um, things that are galvanized that can fit together and move. Um, so it is possible to do for sure, but it does take a little bit more care and consideration up front to make sure it's going to work after. All right, the competition criteria calls for the design to be 100% HDG. Does this include the footings for the ramp? Um, if, say, it's not sitting on a hard surface, such as a concrete walkway? Um, as much as possible. And, you know, the, the goal is that it should be lightweight enough in design that, um, you know, if it has a base plate or something that can be connected to the ground, it shouldn't need a lot of footing probably. It may need a little bit. But, you know, if you need to implement um, or have some recommendations in there for that type of situation, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be galvanized steel in that instance. but. Um, you know, you can bury galvanized steel in the soil and it will perform very well. So it might just be that you need to extend, um, you know, that maybe the um, actual part of the galvanized steel that can go down into the earth a little bit more for more stability. Um, but again, the goal is if our member members are going to donate this work, they only produce the galvanized coating. So anytime that you're adding other elements to that they don't, readily have available to produce for you, it's going to make it more difficult for them to create the ramp. So as much as possible, I would stick to um, just galvanized steel. But if there are some minimal elements that you need, like I made the example earlier where you're using some continuous sheet galvanizing, um, I think that you know there's exceptions that can be made. Um, but certainly, you know, at least our panel member on um, the jury is going to heavily favor any design that uses only galvanized steel. All right, 
is the ramp only intended for wheelchairs or any ambulatory person with a disability? Uh, I think for any. Um, it does need to, to meet the like ADA codes of US and Canada. So that would mean you would probably want to design it in a way that it's wide enough for a wheelchair. Um, just because, you know, tip a lot of times that may be the necessity. But if it's for someone that just um, really needs a ramp, but they are not in a chair, that's okay. But I think that if you're designing it with the idea in mind that it would be able to fit a wheelchair, anyone with any other sort of disability should be able to use it as well just, just fine. All right, I think this might be our last question. Um, okay. under, extreme, under extreme heat, does galvanized steel conduct heat easily? You know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that. I mean, any metal, of course, is going to conduct some heat, but it doesn't get overly warm um, in any way that I can think of. Because, you know, um, typically, like any stadium or speedway, um, like at your university or whatever that you typically go to, almost always the handrails are galvanized. Um, so they're not going to absorb so much heat that it's going to like burn someone or be of concern uh, because that's a typical, I mean, almost all handrail that you see is galvanized. So it's probably going to conduct some heat, but a lot of times the areas that do are going to be um, maybe hollow where they have some air circulation going through them. Um, obviously, if you know it's a really hot day in direct sunlight, you might not want to sit directly onto the galvanized steel, uh, just like you probably wouldn't sit on a steel beam because it might be kind of warm. Um, but it's not going to be hot enough to like necessarily burn your skin or anything of that nature. Um, but I can certainly follow up, or if you have more concern about that, let me know. And our technical department can probably tell you a little bit more. But um, not anything that's going to be of concern or of danger to anyone that's using the ramp. All right, it looks like we have one more. Um, should designs also accommodate people assisting veteran, veterans getting up the ramp? Yeah, I think, you know, as much as you can accommodate for any of those, those items is best. Um, you know, typically if someone's aiding them, um, if they're in a wheelchair, they're probably behind them or in front of them pushing or pulling. So that would be um, probably taken care of. If they're on crutches or some other kind of um, area, they may be to the side of them. But if you're working on a ramp that's wide enough to fit um, a wheelchair comfortably, I don't think you would have an issue with it not being wide enough for whatever you know kind of um, assistance they may be needing. Um, another you know great resource to talk to, and even though they may have concrete ramps or um, other things is maybe with a local hospital or um, if you have a rehab facility in your area, to go and look at the ramps that they use and look at the size and the elevation of them and maybe talk with them some or get into the ADA requirements and see how that will direct your design in a different direction. All right. I think we are wrapping it up. Um, again, this whole presentation um, was recorded and it will be posted on the AIAS website um, backslash ascension. Um, so if you guys have any further questions, you can just go there, um, review what we already talked about, um, email us if you have any additional questions. And thank you, Melissa, um, and everybody who attended. I hope uh, everyone found this beneficial. Thank you as well, and I also want to just compliment all of you. There's are very, very astute questions, um, and it, it tells me a lot that you've done your research or you were listening very well today. So I really appreciate that, and please don't hesitate to contact me as well if you have further questions. Awesome. Thank you again.